amazing inspirational stuff so far. Okay, so I've designed at companies like Google and at Microsoft, and I want to let you all in on a little secret weapon of innovation that I've used that I also think is the key for helping to transform education. And you can probably guess from this picture what that secret weapon is. It's Play-Doh. It's actually not just Play-Doh, it's any familiar and simple tool for making, like paper, or post-it notes, or Sharpie markers, and all of you have some modeling clay. So we're gonna do some, all of you guys are gonna make something with me in a little bit, so get ready. You got a couple of minutes. All right, now, the reason why Play-Doh is so powerful is something that I have to tell you about by telling you my story. So let me start at the beginning. Okay, this is me 40 years ago, on the day I was born, with my mom. Such a sweet expression on her face. Now this is a better picture of my mom. Because she's a crazy actress. And this is my dad, who's a graphic designer. This is him at his first junior design job at an ad agency in Ireland. And you know, growing up with two creative parents was kind of awesome. I mean, not having money kind of sucked a little bit, but we had full permission to create. And we had this room where you could just make and get messy and not worry about cleaning up. This is me, actually. We had this cheap shower board. And you could draw these big pictures and erase them. This is long before whiteboards were like a thing of innovation, right? And this is me, fast forward a decade. If you can't tell which one I am, it's the, the handsome guy with a lot of hair in the middle. I started expressing my creativity through hip hop dance. Actually, this is me and a dance crew at an international high school where my roommates were from all over the world. And so after high school, I was not ready for university. My passion was kind of, I traveled around the world and did social and economic development through the performing arts. This is me in Ghana. And when I decided to get serious, I went to Tufts University in Boston. There's a couple of folks from Tufts, some jumbos, brown and blue. So Tufts was the best at international relations, and my plan was I was gonna save the world. The one thing I said I would never do is design. This is my dad, another picture, who I look a lot more like now. And, you know, I don't think I have a lot of deep daddy issues, but you know, when you're 19, you just wanna do your own thing, right? But two things changed all my plans. First thing that happened is I learned that Tufts had a sister school in Boston, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Maybe not as good as SCAD, but still pretty good. And you could take as many classes and not pay extra tuition. The second thing is my dad sent me a book written by this guy, Richard Saul Werman. Raise your hand if you know who Richard Saul Werman is. Okay, we got a couple. So Richard Saul Werman is the founder of TED, first of all. So you should all figure out who this guy is. Second of all, he coined the term information architecture, right? The role of a designer at taking massively complex information and making it simple and clear. And before the internet, he was designing things like roadmaps. But then when the internet came, this whole new breed of information architects came out. And in this book, he talked about this guy. This is Clement Mock, an ex-Apple creative director who started a design studio doing all of this new kind of experience design. How many of you guys work with or are a user experience designer? Raise your hand. Nice. Okay, we got a few of you guys. So that's what I went into. I became a, 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 an experience designer and I ended up working for Clement and one of my first projects was for United Airlines super complex website, tens of thousands of pages, lots of transactions. And in the beginning of the process, we had these weird people called design researchers who came in and over a period of a week brought in ordinary people and they gave them stuff like this, paper, post-it notes and markers. And they had them envision their ideal homepage. And they had them kind of go through the process of kind of going through what a website would be like. And honestly, I was kind of pissed. Because I'm the designer. Why are you having these people who have no design training sketch this website that I'm getting paid $300 an hour to make, right? But when I saw that this method 
produced insight and inspiration that solved the most complex interaction problems for this website, I was floored. And so I took those crazy design researchers out to lunch and I said, where does this come from? I need to learn more. And they introduced me to this woman on the right with the striped shirt. This is Dr. Liz Sanders, who is my hero, who almost no one knows about, but she is the mother of modern co-creation and participatory design. And I read one of her papers and she made this statement. She said, there is no such thing as experience design. And again, I was pissed. What are you talking about? I'm an experience designer, right? But then I learned about her definition of experience. It's a moment in time. And it's individually felt. It's inside of us. At the intersection of our memories of the past and our dreams of the future, and we can't even understand our own experiences. You all are gonna like blog and, and kind of talk about this experience and maybe a week or a month or a year later, you'll realize the true meaning of this experience. If we can barely understand our own experience, how can we be so egotistical to design that for someone else? We can't. But she did say, you can design for experience. That one small three letter word for changed my life, and it opened me up to Plato. Now, the other thing that I thought was really interesting about this definition is dreams. What do people dream? And how can I learn about that as a designer? And, well, according to Liz, she said there's only three ways to understand people. What they say, what they do, and what they make. What they say is 90% of traditional research, surveys, interviews, one-on-ones, focus groups. Now, I don't know about you guys, but people do very different things often than what they say, right? So this whole area of do, actually watching people's behavior, you get deeper insights. But the deepest insights come from making. Here's an actual toolkit that Liz used for Microsoft. This is called a Velcro modeling kit. And this father and son in their living room are putting these pieces together to create props, to tell stories about how they want a future game controller to work. You know, in Microsoft, designers aren't looking at this like, oh, the radii of this button is perfect for my industrial design, right? But they're looking at these stories about people's dreams and what they want to do. And so I was hooked. Now, get your Play-Doh ready. You guys have a Hong Kong version of Play-Doh. I wouldn't eat it. So get out your Play-Doh, and I'm going to have you guys make something. It's going to be really quick, 30 seconds, okay? And while you get ready, I just have a question. Yell out to me if you know what Play-Doh was called before it was Play-Doh. Anybody? So I heard flour. I heard some other things I don't understand. It was called Kutal which is awesome because I was just in Amsterdam giving this talk, and Kutal means female genitalia. <laughs> and everyone laughed, and I had no idea why. No, Kutal was wall cleaner. So in the early 1900s, coal-burning stoves would leave soot on the walls, and Kutal was used to kind of clean it off. Now, you can imagine that business started to literally dry up, right, as we switched to gas and electricity. But what happened was one of the executives at Kutal noticed that a school teacher, back to education, right? A school teacher was using Kutal in the classroom, putting in food coloring drops and using it as a modeling clay. And that executive said, this is the future of our company. And Play-Doh was born. Okay, everyone ready? Hold up your, uh, hold up your Kutal, <laughs> whatever this is. And on the count of three, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to design your most beautiful, dream, innovative toothbrush. Go. Twenty seconds left. Bye.
five, three, <laughs> that's an awful sound. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I actually wanna see some of the things that you guys made. All right, what do we got? Any brave volunteers, stand up and show me what you got. All right, sir, what, do you, what have you made here? Here, stand up. Uh, uh, a mouth guard thing. <laughs> okay, he made a mouth guard thing. Okay, who else? Anyone over here? Okay, why don't you stand up, sir? It's very small, very compact, and you just put your toothbrush toothpaste there and scrub. That's awesome. It's like a toothbrush nugget. All right, we got someone over here. What do you got? I've got a seahorse, so you just... <laughs> a seahorse that just kind of floats around in your mouth. That's awesome. I love that. Fantastic. Okay, good. Okay, give yourselves a big round of applause. Amazing. Okay, now... I've seen, I've done this a few times, and every time I'm just blown away by the kind of creativity that people make. And actually, there's a company called IDEO. They're a really well-known design company that was asked to design a toothbrush for Oral-B, for kids. And they said, well, we have to watch kids brush their teeth. And Oral-B executives were like, wait, you're gonna go into people's homes, in their bathrooms, and watch their kids brush their teeth. And they're like, yeah, yeah, because we need to see what people do, right? So they did that, and they saw this picture. And they noticed that kids hold toothbrushes very differently than adults. Adults use their fingers and have manual dexterity, but kids, they just fat fist it. And with these really small adult toothbrushes, they're flopping around, right? So that one small observation led to the squish grip now, you go into any store, and I've been here to 7-Eleven and these corner stores, children's toothbrushes everywhere now are these fat-handled things, right? That's the power of do. But if IDEO had given them Play-Doh and had them make their dream toothbrushes, you would have seen it right in front of you and probably some other awesome things. Okay, so thank you guys for helping me make. Don't throw this out. Make stuff throughout the conference because I'm sure it'll inspire you along the way. Now, the last 10 years of my career have been trying to figure out how to get people in the middle of the design process. And I'll show you a couple examples and then I'll tell you why I think it's important for education. So, before Microsoft Service was a tiny little tablet, it was a big ass table. And I worked on the interaction design for this project. And honestly, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Nobody knew what the hell they were doing when you don't have a mouse and a keyboard. So we designed this layer of acrylic that you could put on top of the table, and we went to a local stationery store and got physical pieces of plastic, and we had people come in, and this is one of the participants actually cut up the plastic and made a keychain. And we included that in all the future research, and everybody loved it. It was this beautiful thing that collapsed really small, and then open it up when you needed it. It was 360. And then more recently, at Motorola, I was part of the team that helped the early thinking for the Moto X. We actually went to people's homes. This is in San Francisco. And if you see on the chair there, there's this stack of little white squares of different sizes. And these were like little whiteboards, and people could make props. And in their living rooms, families would act out the future for us. This couple made this television that when they walked home, the television says, welcome home. <laughs> I just watched the movie Her recently, and it you know, kind of freaks me out a little bit. But, um, but we saw this happen a lot where people were interacting really naturally just with voice. And this inspired us to think about how we could do that for Moto X. And so we're brainstorming here with some of the folks on our team, and we ultimately ended up creating this. This is touchless uh, control. So you can talk to your phone even if it's sitting next to you in the car. You don't even have to press buttons and ask it to do stuff for you, right? So that came from people, giving people tools to create. And then most recently, um, I've been working on this project. Raise your hand if you know what this is. Okay, a few of you guys. So this is a modular smartphone. It's kind of like if a smartphone and Lego had a baby. <laughs> it might look like this, right? So this is a phone that you can move the pieces and parts and anybody can create hardware for it. 
But it actually started out on this 14,000 mile journey across the country. This van is covered in Velcro because it's a symbol of creativity. You stick anything to it, you can change the design. It's got 3D printers inside. It's got hackable electronics. And that's my 15-year-old son with a skateboard up there as well. That's the only way my wife would let me go on this journey <laughs> if I took him with me. And we went across the country and we explored with the future engineers and designers what they wanted from technology. And here are some of their ideas. And in just a day, like Ryan was talking about this startup weekend, how his team came together, we had teams create amazing things. Like this team at Caltech created a glove using flex sensors and capacitive pads that translated sign language into text messages so that the deaf could com you know, communicate with anyone. And there were 60 other projects like this that blew us away, so we knew that if students could create this kind of stuff using just simple tools, in just a day, we had to make a platform for the world. And so we launched Project Aura, where anybody can contribute to this project. But what's mo what you guys may not know is we also invited the whole world to design with us. So this is actually a better picture. This is, we have over 28,000 people around the world from over 111 countries voluntarily participating in design challenges with us every month where they get to decide even things as simple as the size. In the first 24 hours of starting this, these were the posts around the world. Lots of things in North America and Europe, but not only, right? We had people from all over participating. One of the things we had people do is make their own phone. Perfect width, perfect height, and we actually designed the three sizes of this phone based on the stuff that people made. And there's a lot more happening. Okay, so, how does this relate to education? Let me just wrap up with really quickly, this is my family, there's five of us. And unfortunately, we live in Silicon Valley, there are actually 3.4 screens for every human being in our household. <laughs> and it's a little ridiculous, I know, but I think my, my wife and I got to a point where our kids were just totally, you know, consumed by these screens, right? And so we put our foot down, two hours a week only in passive consumption of media. And our kids were like, oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> My friends have three hours a day. We said, look, you can be on a screen after that if you want to, but you have to create, you have to make. And just like Ryan, my 15-year-old loved finding the latest trap and dubstep music on SoundCloud. So he started making his own trap music. He's now got almost 400 followers. He's posted six songs, he's learned Ableton software, and he's you know, starting to make music. And my 13-year-old created his own Minecraft server. You know, he had people like, you know, betray him and destroy his files. Um, you know, but in the end, he actually made $800 in three months in donations, which he's now investing into his second Minecraft server, right? So amazing stuff. And so when my wife and I were talking about this, she said, look, she shared with me this quotation from this thinker and writer, Baha'u'llah, from the end of the 1900s, who said, regard man as a mime, rich in gems, of inestimable value. Education alone can cause it to reveal its treasures. And this made me realize that just like at my work, at Microsoft and Google, just like at education, we sometimes have it all wrong. You know, any species in this world can consume but it's only human beings who can truly create. And so what I ask you, whether you're a teacher, or whether you're a consultant, whether you make hardware or software, or whether you sell hot dogs on the streets, whatever you do, find ways to collaborate and involve the people who inspire you to, to, to design and to make in the middle of your process. If you give them some Play-Doh, you might just be really surprised. Thank you.